All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, let me open us up with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to, to dig into your word, and uh, we pray that you will guide us by your Holy Spirit and to understanding it and reveal its truth to us. And I pray for a fruitful time together, a fruitful discussion, and we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So tonight we are continuing in the Sermon on the Mount and we are coming to the end of chapter 6 of, of Matthew uh, and the beginning of chapter 7 and uh, hits on a couple of different passages that deal, as you can see at the top there, with worry and with judging. And so we're going to start, uh, dive right in here. Can someone read the Matthew six twenty five through 34 for us? Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Not there. All right. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, Word of the Lord. So often we will say we are theists, you know, people who believe in a personal God uh, who's our creator, our provider, our sustainer. But in reality, we act like deists. We act like God is this distant, impersonal, uninvolved being. We say we trust in God to provide our needs, but then we act like it depends all on our own efforts. Uh, we're anxious and we're fearful. Um, the ancient Israelites understood their dependency on God, and they prayed to Him for provision, and they thanked Him when, uh, for, for what they already had and what for He would provide in the future. And there was this entire framework that they had that was they saw as tied to their obedience to him. And you see it in like uh, the, that series of blessings and curses in Deuteronomy and Leviticus where God explains, you know, if you do these things, you'll be blessed. And if you do these things, you're going to be cursed. And so they had this very keen understanding of God as like their provider. Um, they, they understood him to be responsible for their sustenance and everything that they would need and that the presence or lack of them was all an act of God. But it's also clear that when you read the whole of the scriptures, and even just the Old Testament scriptures that the Israelites would have had, is that it wasn't a one-to-one -one correlation you know, between obedience and provision. Because we have examples like Job. You know, Job... Um, had blessing withheld from him and even in some cases taken from him as a test of his faith. Um, you have the exile of the children of Israel into Babylon when their leaders fell into sin, but not everybody 
in Israel was sinful, but they got dragged off into slavery just like everyone else. Uh, Amos and Haggai, uh, among the prophets, uh, point out very, uh, in very stark terms of how the poor suffer because the powerful exploit and use them. So there, there are the, the, it's a general thing in that the overarching testimony of the biblical story is that God does provide. And we can see that. You know, it's there, there's the manna and the quail in the wilderness when the, when the children of Israel are wandering after leave, leaving Egypt. You've got God sustaining Elisha as he's being hunted down by Jezebel and he's narrated off himself. Um, you have the feeding miracles of Jesus and even the Eucharist itself. So the scriptures also replete with this idea that God provides for his people. So what... What is Jesus exactly getting at when he's, when he's talking about this thing and not worrying about your needs and, and, and the, your provisions? Um, it, the passage follows on, if you, if you were here last week with what Leah taught, this follows on last week where she was talking about, where Jesus was talking about um, storing up treasures and storing them up in heaven rather than, than down here on earth. And Jesus is still talking here in that same vein. He didn't just kind of switch gears. He's, he's following on to that with this, this part of it. And he's still talking about the danger of possessions and their capacity to become idols. Um, they sidetrack us from faithfulness and his mission, the kingdom mission that he's bringing to us. And so... He's kind of tying a couple of things together here. He want, he, he's saying he wants us to trust God for provisions, but not just for the sake of getting what we need, but he's wanting us to trust him so that we can focus on his kingdom and his righteousness. Those two things are connected. Um, in this section, he drives home the, you know, where he says, do not worry about this. And he says it three times. He says it in verse 25. In verse 31, he says it in verse 34, and he associates, he associates it with these reasons. He says, first of all, don't worry because this is pagan behavior. This is, what, this is what pagans do. And then the second reason is that God cares about you. And the third thing he says is that each day has its own problems, so let tomorrow take care of itself. And so it's one of those rare instances. We've talked a lot over these weeks. You've heard us talk about this ethic from above and ethic from beyond where, God, where Jesus is, is giving the words of God to us or he is calling us to see things in light of where God's taking things, the, the end that God is going to bring the world to, making all things right and accomplishing his purposes. But this is one of those rare times where he's using that thing that we call an ethic from below. And all that means is it's just wisdom-based. It's, it's common sense and learning from watching human interaction and observation in the world. He's just giving you practical advice here. Um, so note that in this situation with the Sermon on the Mount, you're, he is mostly talking. You know, he's got a, 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 there are some great crowds, but a lot of what he's focusing here, he's talking to his followers, and not just the 12. He is talking to his disciples or the apostles, but uh, a broader segment of people who were called his disciples, but they, they were in the dozens or maybe even hundreds at times. And so Jesus here is not giving like a general sermon that's addressing the poor who lack provisions, say, as a result of famine or as a result of war. Or something like, you know, what I talked about with the Israelites being taken into captivity. You know, those are unique circumstances. Um, he's talking to a group of people who more or less have what they need. Um, they aren't rich per se, but they're not destitute either. And if you, if you read further, just another couple of chapters after this, this is right before Jesus sends out like I think it's the 70 or the 72, depending on the, the translation. 
he sends them out into all the towns to, to, to proclaim the gospel. And he tells them in that moment to not worry about securing provisions for themselves, that God will take care of them, to rely on the, the generosity of the people that they come to, and that they're going to they're gonna be fine, that God will take care of it. So when he's telling us, he says, you know, not worry, what exactly is he getting at? So we know in a general sense what worry is. It's like this, this inner turmoil or this kind of disturbance kind of at your emotional and psychological level of it's just some and it disrupts your day. Like it interrupts you from being able to concentrate on the things of the day because you're fretting and you're concerned and you're, you're pouring over it. But specifically here, uh, it, it more is, is directed as like an, an anxious endeavor to secure one's needs. So he's, he's getting at kind of that ground level of just being worried about like, where's the next, where's the next thing coming? Is, is God going to bring this on time? Am I going to be able to pay the bills? Am I going to be able to put food on the table? Um, the example that he gives is, of birds and flowers is really interesting because with birds, um, if you think about the way birds do their thing, they're not like squirrels, for instance. You know, they don't store. You know, they don't, they, they, there's no, they're, they're not concerned the way people are with sowing and reaping and, and harvesting and, and, and saving for a rainy day. It's just like they just gather every day what they need and put it together. Um, and if God cares so much about providing the things that they need, then how much more so would he care for people who are made in his image, who he, he literally breathed his spirit into them to give them life? I mean, that's the, the level. He didn't do that for birds. He didn't do that for, for other things. Um, he indwells us, and we are his temple. So obviously, yes, Jesus is going, obviously, if he's going to take care of them, he'll take care of you. And, you know, the same thing with flowers. These are, you know, they're, they're, they're beautiful, but Jesus is making this point that of these lesser things that God takes care of. So, of course, he's going to take care of the greater things, which is, you know, the, the people that he made for himself. Um, and so when we refuse or we're unable to see the providence of God in our lives, to... To, to, to love and trust in a caring father. We fall into that category that he says, oh, oh you of little faith. It's, it's not unbelief. It's not apostasy. You're not, you know, you're not lost. But it's not faithful discipleship either. You know, you're, you're letting the, 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 the troubles of the world come in between you and, 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 uh, and your father who cares about you. Um, and finally, in referencing the pagans, and in, in the Jewish mind, it's Gentile. You know, like he says pagans, they're thinking Gentile, they're thinking Roman. Uh, that's, that's the world they lived in, the sea they swam in. So um, Jesus is making a very sharp point, and, and that is that if we go around fretting all the time about these kinds of things, then how do we really distinguish ourselves from the surrounding culture? Like, how is following Jesus attractive to a lost world if we look just as anxiety-ridden as they do? You could see the, the disconnect. It's like if somebody is, is thinking about, like, what, what would attract them to a relationship with God and, and seeing the people who claim to follow him be just as wound up about all these things as they are is not obviously not going to be much of a draw. Um, there are probably many more areas of our lives that we can apply to this than just say money or material resources. Um, what are some things I think, like, and you can think this to yourself, you can write it down, or if somebody wants to, to say something out loud, what kind of things make us anxious? And what does that say about our trust level with God? 
Anybody got any examples that they want to share? Health. Health. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's just their children's choices. <laughs> oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> you want to tell them what to do, but they're really too old. <laughs> yeah. For real. That is good. The weather, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, so, so Jesus, you know, talks about these kind of things, and then he, he, he kind of gives us more or less a strategy or a, or a way of he wants us to handle it, and that is to pursue his kingdom and his righteousness. So the kingdom that he talks about, you know, he's talking about this is the this is the story that God has written through the people of Israel and is continuing to write through the church. And it, it's directed at his hope for the world, where it's going, the completion of all things and the making right of everything, putting the world back the way that it was always intended to be. This is, this is where God is taking us. He wants us to join in that kingdom and that message. And then righteousness is pretty straightforward. It's conformity to God's will. And he kind of already said this just a few passages back. I mean, it was Jeremiah a couple of weeks ago in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I mean, it's, it's, he evokes this early on. So what that means is as disciples of Jesus... We're being called to focus on, to plot, and to act out in our lives in a way that keeps us aimed at this goal. Think of like an Olympic athlete who has, they have aimed their entire life at winning an Olympic gold medal. And it affects everything they do. It affects how they spend their time, what they put their effort into, what they spend their money on, the, the, the kind of sleep and rest schedule they, they maintain, their diet, they study to get better at what they, they, they are. It's a, it's a goal that causes us to reorder our priorities and shift everything in how we plan and spend and work and save. It's, it, it's this, the reshaping of our view of what matters and what we need to do or change in our lives to reflect that we understand this. So what are some ways that we can sort of redirect our focus and keep our focus in the right places? What, what are some maybe some practices of how we would do this? Mm-hmm. Yes. Daily devotionals. Mm-hmm. Charity. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, regular reading of the Word um, and being, you know, and also with other people who you can either kind of go through it together or hearing you know, teaching from, you know, Father Andrew or other people uh, who, who can help us understand it. And prayer and meditation and worship and all these things, all the kind of those, all those spiritual disciplines that we've talked about, like, you know, meditation, confession, you know, where we're regularly keeping a self-examination and inventory. Uh, and then also I like what you said with charity, you know, because I think part of this too is when we're on mission, there's an action part of this. So, you find ways to get involved. You find ways to put your faith into action and to, and to put this thing into practice. These are the kinds of things, I think, that can help us stay on track and stay thinking in, in kind of that kingdom and righteousness mindset. Um, they help us tune and refocus our vision. Life, life has a million ways to distract us. And, and I think in, in our age, probably more so than anyone 
that's come before it, perhaps. It's an age of distraction. There are a million things to grab your attention, to entertain you, to waste your time. Um, we have to fight back against that pull. Um, we have to employ intentional practices. And, you know, we've, we've taught in some of these classes before, things like a rule of life, you know, things that where we, we discipline ourselves on things like limits on screen time or watching TV or um, we, we have, like, practices, like, when I first get out of bed, what's the first thing I do? Do I pick up my phone or do I kneel beside the bed or go into the other room and pray for, even if it's just for, like, two minutes, to start my day, to acknowledge that my day starts with my acknowledgement of, of being in the presence of God and what does he want me to do today. Um, we, we, we find times of quiet and solitude so hard. This, this world is noisy. It is very noisy. We have to be intentional about pushing that noise away and finding time to, to sit with our own thoughts and allow the Holy Spirit sometimes to, in, to enter in <laughs> to those thoughts and help guide us on some things and show us some things. Uh, it, those kinds of things help push back against like this gravitational pull towards distraction. Um, now something else, I'll, uh, something else I want to mention too, and, and McKnight mentions this as well, is that there are people, and we've mentioned a couple of situations, the, you know, even the faithful poor who struggle with provisions. So, you know, there's famine, there's war, there's oppression, there's, there's all kinds of reasons. Um, just like, you know, the, the situations with Job and the people of Israel in exile. So what, what Jesus is talking about here when he, he says not to worry about this stuff, it's, Jesus was not, his intention was not to give like an, an economic treatise. He wasn't giving like a proposition paper on, on, on easy economics, how to, never, how to never be hungry, so to speak. Um, it's not meant to hu solve hunger and starvation worldwide. Uh, but it is a general principle being taught to a first century audience who have access to provisions. They may not have bounty but they do have sustenance. They have their needs met. So he's, and he's specifically talking to a people, and it's, it, was, it was true then, but it's, it's true for us also. He's, he's talking to people who are striking out on mission with him for his kingdom specifically, and he's, he's calling us to do this and to trust God for what we need when we need it. We may not have everything we want, and times may get a little lean, but God will take care of us. In particular, when we're walking in this path, when we're doing what He's calling us to do, He's not going to let us get, you know, destitute in that. There is a reward to this. Um, Another thing to be mindful of here is, and because some people, there are critics who have read this passage, non-Christian critics who have read this passage and said that it essentially uh, encourages laziness. You know, like, I don't have to do anything. God's going to take care of me. Um, Jesus is not telling anyone here to be careless and lazy. Uh, he is, however, telling us to be carefree to not worry about our provisions and being taken care of. It's not recklessness or laziness, but in following Him, He wants us to see that following Him and seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness, He's not only going to take care of us, but in the process, He's going to reshape what we value. It's all faith, isn't it? Yeah. He's, going to about, he's about to reorient some things for you. Um, money matters. You can't exist in a capitalist society without it. You know, provisions matter, food and, 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 and those kinds of things. But just because something, you know, but matter is not the same thing as worship. 
matter is not the same thing as something I place my trust in. These things matter, but the kingdom matters more. And so the posture becomes one where we begin to sort of relax our grip on our stuff. We quit worrying about that kind of thing. We relax our our need to hover and, and fret about provision. And when we start doing that, that enables us to start seeing others and their needs and to live more in a carefree fashion. That following Jesus and living into his kingdom in this way here on earth and move towards that kingdom that's to come. Now, what that may mean in practical terms for us And this will be different for everybody because not everybody makes the same amount of money or came from the same kind of money, but it's going to mean things like maybe an adjustment to our standard of living. It might mean that we learn to live well within our means, not just barely. Because the whole point of God giving us surplus is not just so that we can take care of what we need, but so that we can give to others and help others. Um, it might mean that we change how much we work, that we adjust the time that we spend at a, at a, at a job or, or taking care of things so that we can use that time for the kingdom, for things that are eternal, not storing up things on earth, but storing up things that last forever. Has anybody got any other thoughts about the kinds of things that it might cause you to have to change or adjust? Well, I agree with you. I don't read this as causing Paul to be lazy at all because, you know, not worrying does not mean you can't be industrious. Mm-hmm. Paul talks about being industrious in his, in his epistles, like get this done, get done, I've worked these many hours a week. You know, um, you know, kind of you know, taking care of yourself Mm-hmm. And not just sitting around, you know, lazily saying, I'm not worried about it. Yeah, and Paul himself, and I believe Peter maybe, I can't remember. I remember one in, in one of the epistles that talks about, you know, a lot of times they did, you know, they did receive like help and, and you know, provision from people they were preaching to. But then they also had like side jobs. They made tents. They did all kinds of stuff. They were industrious so that they sometimes could take the burden off of some churches in areas that didn't have a lot. Um, But also, it was just a means to an end to them. You know, it wasn't, you know, so that I can build bigger and bigger things and have more stuff, you know. And not that having stuff is necessarily wrong, but Paul did everything, and and Peter and these guys were doing things with a purpose. And, uh, And it was a kingdom purpose. points to idolatry, Mm -hmm. that that those things that we have to not worry about, that we have that we should adjust our standard of living in order to accomplish things. When our standard when our our standard of living, maintaining standard of living becomes an idol in our lives, then we're not willing to 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 do that. Mm -hmm. When uh, when um, our job becomes an idol in our lives we're not willing to, to devote less hours to it so that we can do other things that advance the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, in the United States, the, 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 the great stories of, uh, of uh, the great stories in our history are people who pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, you know, mm-hmm. and all that, which is a lie in and of itself. But, <laughs> But it's all about people that work so hard that, that they wouldn't allow, you know. That they, Protestant they not, work ethic. They were not going <laughs> to fail, you know. And Jesus is saying, that's getting your life out of, your, your life is not properly oriented, I think, mm-hmm. if, if that's what you're doing. I, again, I stand.
stand to be corrected. No, no, I think you're, I think you're spot this on. This is striking me that this is, that he's addressing perhaps what he sees as idols in, in the general population in, in people's lives. Yeah, I would agree. I was thinking about Hebrews 12. Let's throw off everything that hinders yeah. our sin and entanglement. And things that hinder aren't always bad. You know what I'm saying? It's like the sin does, but there's other things that can hinder you that are not bad in and of themselves. You know, they're, they're fine and good, kept in their proper perspective. So, well, that's good. That's good. Well, let's move to the second section. This is Matthew 7, talking about judging. And... This is one of the more famous passages in Scripture. It's one that, I mean, we live in a culture that has become, that has lost so much biblical literacy. (laughs) But somehow, even over the past generation or two with all that, this one amazingly sticks very well because people can flip out that do not judge thing in a heartbeat if you call them on the wrong thing. Um, Anytime some moral issue is being debated or... Sometimes even within the church when, a, say, a Christian leader of some kind is caught in a scandal and the public discussion over what should happen to them comes up. Come we get, well, I could go a lot of places. But, I mean, just this week, <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> but you hear it, you know, judge not lest you be judged. Um, so let's read this passage. Will someone read the Matthew 7, 1 through 5 passage for me? I'll do it. Okay. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, Word of the Lord. So this passage is kind of fraught with some tension and questions because, you know, like we said, it's one of the most misunderstood passages, I think, of Scripture. But also, if you've spent more than, say, 15 minutes reading a Bible, um, you can see that almost any book you turn to, you're going to run into God making you know, giving commandments over and over about stuff, saying this is right and do this and this is wrong and don't do that. And, you know, you have the prophets and the apostles, you know, that wrote the New Testament that have these repeated warnings about the sinfulness of the people and what was going to happen if they failed to turn from their sins. So it seems like there's a lot of judging going on in the Bible. And it's not hard for people who regularly read their Bibles to begin to kind of think like God about themselves and others. You're picking up on, you kind of, you you find yourself in this role and there's an aspect of this that's actually good because I want to learn to love the things that God loves and to hate the things that God hates. At a basic level, that's that's what I want. When I'm studying scripture, that's the effect that I hope that it has on me is that I'm becoming more like him that that the things that he wants and the things that he loves and he desires those are my heart's desire and the things that he hates and that he doesn't want to see those are the things that I'm against but there's a danger when it carries too far in that even though we can kind of start when we read the Bible we're seeing from God's perspective we aren't actually supposed to stand in for God and become judges. James 4, 11 through 12 says, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you... Who are you to judge your neighbor? And I mentioned Romans 14, but that whole chapter 
goes into this thing about judging our brothers uh, and sisters. So James here is warning his readers that when they start judging others, they're actually assuming the posture of God in that person's life, not the posture of human beings, which is where we're supposed to stick. (laughs) That's our place. Um, They're usurping God's role is what's happening. Um, it's, It's very hard to do this sometimes when you immerse yourself in scriptures, but learning to understand God's perspective on something does not make us God. We may know what he thinks, but we are not him. And so the point here is that we need to learn the difference between moral discernment and personal condemnation. It's good to know the difference in what's good from what's bad, but it's not our place to condemn somebody else. And if we can kind of get our heads around that, we can begin to see what Jesus is driving at in this passage when he tells us not to judge. Another way to think about it is this, is that it's one thing to point out that certain actions are wrong. I mean, that's an objective statement. Um, But it's an entirely different thing to presume that you know the motive behind why someone did the thing they did. What drove them to it? What was in their heart? You can't know a person's heart. You cannot know their intentions. And when you assume that you do and you condemn them, then you're walking into the thing that Jesus is talking about here. Um, This makes sense when you set it in the context of the rest of the sermon up to this point because part of the thing that that Jesus talks about when he's talking about this mission that we're on is one that is seeking the reconciliation of the lost. It's seeking for people to be reconciled to their Father in heaven and reconciled to each other as well rather than damnation. That's not, Jesus is not focusing on condemnation and damnation in the Sermon on the Mount. He's calling people into closer relationship with God and closer relationship with each other, even our enemies, as we've talked about before. So thinking of it in this way kind of enables us to kind of walk a tightrope between a couple of extremes. Um, And I think that this culture does a bad job of this and sometimes even the church And the two extremes are, on the one hand, becoming mute about moral judgment. We actually have a responsibility to talk about those things. But then the other extreme is is where we end up ignoring this powerful warning about assuming that we're God for other people. And Jesus goes on further to say that not only will the person who assumes this posture that, that they're going to be judged, but he says that they'll be judged by the same standard that they use against the other people. I mean, I don't know about you, that's a little scary. <laughs> I can think about a lot of things that I've said and thought about people, and I do not want that same plumb line held up to me and have to measure up to the things that I've thought uh, about people before. And... And that's because when, you, when we get gut level honest with ourselves is that none of us live up to our own standards. We don't even live up to our own standards. Forget God's for a second. We don't even live up to our own standards that we sometimes so rigidly hold other people to. And that can take on various forms. I mean, sometimes that, that leaves you kind of in a state of constant self-condemnation because you try and you fail to live up to those standards or you end up blind to the fact that you're not living up to your own standards. But either way, the warning remains the same. Instead, Jesus points out this example, uh, a little bit of an absurd example, where he says you know, that the other person has this, this speck, this little nothing thing, this irritant in their eye, and you have a plank sticking out of your own. Um, he's making a very pointed 
thing here to say we all have our own stuff to worry about. But it doesn't stop there because the, the point isn't to just shut up and not talk about it. The point is, is that we should see ourselves rightly. We need to do some self-examination and see ourselves as we are, which is sinful people running to God for mercy and grace. So that, here's the, here's the big thing, so that then once the plank through confession and repentance and humility has come over our own eye, we can turn and help other people with their moral failings, with their problems. He wants us to then be able to turn and treat others with mercy. Read, uh, look at the passages there from Galatians and James. Uh, Brothers and sisters, if someone's caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. And then James says, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So we first examine our own hearts under the watchful eye and gaze of the Holy Spirit. And we ask God to show, things, show us things about ourselves. Shine His light into those dark corners of our own hearts and our own minds so that we can confess them and make things right and then we can actually be a help. We can actually go on mission and be part of what God wants to do in the world. Um, we end up, when we, when we go down this road, we have a tendency to sort of camp out on some kind of hobby horses, you know, things that really matter to us more than other things, or we distort and lose perspective on things that are truly essential versus things that aren't. And Jesus saw this in the religious leaders of the day. You sometimes, I've seen this online or when it's spilled into the press, even squabbles among churches and denominations and things of that nature. But listen to what he says to the Pharisees in Matthew 23. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. I mean, <laughs> um, it's a very human tendency to do this, to either focus on sort of these, these minute little nothing things that are in the grand scheme of the world are just not that important while ignoring all kinds of bigger stuff that we're neglecting. It's also a very human tendency, I think, to have a lot more understanding and mercy for people who struggle with sins that I understand. When it's something that, that I've gone through or that somebody close to me has gone through, well, that's easy for me to have compassion and to have mercy. But when it's something that I can't get my head around, that it's just something that's way out there, that's just something I've never had a problem with, suddenly I get way more judgmental and calloused about it. Very matter of fact. And so the way, you know, so we hear this thing get tossed out, like I mentioned earlier. Who am I to judge? You know, judge not lest ye be judged. That isn't the way to walk about this. Because Jesus and the writers in the New Testament make moral judgments all over the place. Sin is still sin. You cannot follow Jesus and turn a blind eye to it. But by the end of that passage, Jesus has us in the position of helping someone else in their moral failures. So moral indifference or blanket tolerance is not what Jesus is driving at. That's what our culture likes to think he was driving at. It's not. 
And so when we hear Christians are judgmental, well, let's be honest, sometimes it's true. Um, A lot of times this charge arises from nothing more than the simple fact that Christians read the Bible and try to obey it and think some things are wrong, like adultery or homosexual conduct or gossip or greed and a whole list of other things. But saying that greed is wrong or sexual sins are wrong isn't being judgmental. That's a moral judgment. But like I said, this charge that Christians aren't, are judgmental isn't entirely wrong for a lot of the reasons that I've already said. And we need to own that as individual followers of Christ in the church as a whole. And we need to ask ourselves, we need to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, why could Jesus speak so plainly about sin and its consequences and call people sinners and, and all these kinds of things, yet sinners were drawn to him? Sinners wanted to be around him. They wanted to sit at his table. And then so often, they're kind of repelled by us and by the church. It's not as simple, well, you know, you can't just say, well, he's Jesus, you know, because we're supposed to be like Jesus. So if we're not, then that's something we need to reckon with. It's because of how he was and how often we are not. I want to close with a passage that you're probably very familiar with at at, uh, the end of uh, uh, John chapter 7. And I'm just going to read this. He says, Then they all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And at dawn he appeared in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in an act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started, write, started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who's, who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus' first concern was to quell the condemnation and put the accusers in their place. It was to defend the accused who apparently was actually guilty. I mean, she wasn't being falsely accused. But it was to defend her from this judgmentalism that was coming from these men. And then he turned his attention to the woman and called her into repentance and to be reconciled with her father. It was gentle. It was kind. It didn't downplay or ignore her sin. But he didn't browbeat her with it either. And I just think that this is is probably the best example of how to live out this passage on judgment that I could offer. Any final thoughts? <laughs> I know. I think he was doing the symbol for the church. <coughs> I've heard people I say maybe he was. I want to know. I've, I've heard maybe he was writing down the things that some of the other people around there had done. He was writing their sins in the sand. Um, I've always wondered where the, where the partner was. I mean, it takes two to do that, 
That's, and that's part of the reason that Jesus says what he says and the way he handles it is because he realizes that even though this woman is guilty, there's a man involved here that's not getting anything. You know, like she didn't, she didn't you can't commit adultery by yourself. So, yeah, he was, there were many layers to what Jesus and how, how Jesus reacted to this. Now, I, I'm just off the question of related to that. Is the, in, under the law, was a man subject to the same death penalty as a woman? No. Well, he was supposed to. He was. The, under the law, yes. In, in the way the law frequently actually worked, no. I'm just, you know, in that time, I mean, you know, women really, they bore the brunt of, of, I mean, they were in danger on, in a lot of circumstances. Of, you know, a widow who had no sons to take care of her was, she was shoved to the very edges of society. And, uh, well, it was, it was a hard life was, back it then. Hard. It was, the, it was, it was demanding physical labor and it usually required, you know, a family and some strong boys, you know, uh, to, to do certain things. And an older woman who couldn't do, who, you know, she may have been able to pull her own weight a little bit when she was a lot younger, but, you know, in her later years, you know, if, if it's all depending on her, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, Jesus was definitely calling out some hypocrisy here. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that it frequently did work out was that, you know, the woman tempted him and was a Jezebel. And, and the man, you know, well. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for a good discussion. And I'm going to let you guys go get in line a little bit early. Thank you.